hurdles for evidence. I mean, you, you can't simply say there's a pattern here and I'm part of it. You really have to really show a connection, a causal link between, you know, the allegation and the discrimination. So, again, it's burdensome, it's laborious, um, and it's, it's really very necessary. Mm -hmm. But again, the big bangs, like the stewardess case, yeah. back in the 70s, I mean, that got great press. Mm -hmm. yeah, but most of the work just isn't good for television. You yeah. know, it just it's just work. <laughs> you know, it's just not sexy. It's not romantic. It's yeah. not sexy. Yeah, we can't all be Shea Guevara. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so thank goodness. Well, it's good to hear that there is some you know interest by young people in continuing this. Yeah. Uh, and I think that I, I was somewhere a few months ago, and I. I don't know quite how it happened, but uh, the woman was a professor of a university, and she was teaching something like, you know, uh, modern day culture or something like mm -hmm. that. And I don't know how we got around to it, but I mentioned to her, uh, I said, you know, it wasn't all that long ago, you know, liberation of bars. We were not permitted to sit down for lunch in a restaurant because we made noise, and she had never heard about this before. And I said, well, you know, it was back in the 70s. It wasn't all that long ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and the women who were affected by this took it upon themselves to challenge that license because we're 50% or so of the public. Mm -hmm. We demand a beer, therefore mm -hmm. you have to serve us. And we did have some of their liquor licenses rescinded. When they refused. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. But in those days, you've got an article in there. It was pressworthy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now they would probably think we were crazy. <laughs> well, that issue is not an issue anymore. You know, it's not an issue anymore. No. <laughs> now it's what happens to women when they're in bars that's a problem. That's right. The sexual assault <laughs> when they get slipped. Yeah. Now something. there's a new there's a new there's a new set of concerns, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, but the work the work that you were doing. I mean, one of the reasons I'm hoping this project, one of the ways I want it to be effective, mm -hmm. is to have good descriptions of the work that people in the movement were doing. So <coughs> that young people <laughs> who we're mm -hmm. concerned about will hear it and go, oh, that's what the work is like. Mm -hmm. You know? I don't have to get arrested. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the appropriate response to every problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's work in all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. right? It's not just lobbying a politician, there's supporting people in their lawsuits concerning employment discrimination, there's helping people, there's the court watches that people did in the 70s and the 80s to make sure that judges actually dispensed the law, the law mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. When they finally passed the rule, it's like, doesn't matter what she was wearing, <laughs> we had to make sure nobody asked that question, you know? <laughs> Women had to go sit, men too, had to go sit in those rooms and watch so that they could walk outside and go, that didn't work, they weren't doing it right. Um, that kind of day-to-day -day attention to the working of the system, um, I think is one of the things is worth talking about. Yeah. It's worth hearing you guys yeah. talk about um, what you were doing and how often and well, you went with, with, with You were connecting your work with the De Department of Defense, which was uh, contract compliance, right? Which was civil rights. with which had to do with civil rights of veterans in employment, mm -hmm. and then extracting that from behavior of employers towards women employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went on for a number of years. He was also one of the early employees of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Oh, really? Yeah, I worked there for what, three or four years? Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, I was the first uh, person hired outside of the Washington, D.C. area down in Atlanta, Georgia, which was the first office. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked there for about three years. What were you finding? What kinds of well, th you know, things that were very Issues different. We were, yeah, I'm sure it was probably they fascinating. Classified, <laughs> things, classified sections of the paper that were not only discriminated segregated by sex, but by race. Hmm. They had colored collars, you know, white. Women? Yeah. Yeah. Women need not apply would be stated in the classified ad. 
now it, it's more subtle. You get things, if you're a lawyer, uh, two to three years experience, which is an age thing. Mm -hmm. It's an age thing. So the scenario shifts. But in those days, they were blatant. They were blatant. How did you go about getting that changed? Well, I, I mean, I know a number of people worked on it, but. but uh, I would reassign about four complaints a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I got into the thing, I was special assistant, to the first regional director at the time. But after I first got into it, I would do four months. And then they promised me that they would bring me back to Washington, where my family was. But instead, that disappeared, like many of them promises do. And I went to New York City, and worked for the Department of Defense. And later, I was fortunate enough to get located, relocated to the Office of Federal Contract Compliance here in Washington. Mm -hmm. And later, all of the smaller offices were started than that one. But um, and, and I, I'm convinced that you know my activity was now. Another stance that I took with regard to what the law clearly said and what, how it was interpreted uh, eventually caused me a lot of problems. But I did work for over 40 years in the federal government. And uh, I'm now happily retired. I don't have to worry about income as long as the dollar is good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And she had worked for the government at a much higher level. I, I never worked more than a major. It was mm -hmm. about a 13. Mm -hmm. And Carol worked as the equivalent of a 15, which is a colonel. Mm -hmm. one, one step lower than the general. And come the uh, beginning of next year, we're going to apply for her pension, too. She hasn't applied for it yet. She's leaving the money on the table. Lawyers never retire. Well, they either die or are disbarred. Well, they, they, they can also. My grandfather was a business attorney. Let me tell you. Yeah. They can also ask for their pensions. Well, send me money. Yeah. <laughs> the problem there, to be sort of off, off, off the, off the subject, is, you know, it's one thing if you apply for social security. That took 20 minutes. Very friendly guy at the other end of the telephone. One, two, three, bang, done. Uh, Applying for a pension, there was recently an article in the Washington Post about the Byzantine um, procedure, and there's an office in West Virginia where all of, the, they had a picture of this office with boxes and boxes. It's not computerized. It's just boxes, which reminds me of the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, mm -hmm. remember? Yeah, the file uh, room. And they, <laughs> and they told us it will take a mm -hmm. year from the time you submit the application to the time, you know, they... Well, they ask a lot of questions, and the answers to most of those questions I don't remember. It's a matter of record. Mm. Go look it up. Yeah. <laughs> if you're doing it... You have my employment history. Yes. I worked for you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. When did you leave the for federal you. government employ? Well, don't you know that? <laughs> it's a matter of record. <laughs> Isn't that on a piece of paper in a file in front of you right now? Yeah. But, but it, whatever you put down, they're not going to go by that. They're going to have to check it anyway, because they... Uh, with... with with green shades and a crow quote pen, <laughs> which is exactly the point of the Washington Post article. Yeah. I didn't see that article. Why did you let me see that? Well, we can go into Washington Post archives, but it's very interesting. That's a similar to this situation with the VA then. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. But working for the government, in his case, I mean, he, I would go so far as to say that even though his responsibility was to really enforce civil rights, mm -hmm. um, he was penalized for it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, his involvement in now at the time was certainly not appreciated. And uh, I certainly don't think that my life in investment banking was helped by the fact that I was active. Mm -hmm. But then again, maybe even today, you wouldn't find mm -hmm. activity in any issue because it's just such a conservative environment. Sure. It's yeah. just so conservative. Don't mark the boat. Yeah. Well, and bus I mean, business and actual government employment are, you know, two mm -hmm. places where that's always been true. Um, you know, there's a reason that bohemians tend to go found little utopias out in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> 
or strike away off fog. <laughs> or strike off on their own. Yeah, you know, because that just doesn't work everywhere. You know? That's right. Um, but that's a tremendous amount of you know really conscious um, sacrifice. You know, mm -hmm. I'll take that hit for mm -hmm. this thing that I believe in. I'll take mm -hmm. that hit for the movement for these people who deserve to be well treated. It's a pretty um, difficult stance to take, and it's a hard one to keep holding. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, how was, I mean, when you had that, when you had that conversation, did you ever have those conversations with coworkers? You know? Oh yeah, all the time. What was it, what was that, what was their response? What was your explanation? They, they wanted to be, you know, safe and conservative. And primarily, they, there were two or three others, but we were the ones that spoke up. Mm -hmm. Didn't they call you? It wasn't you, appreciated, and and finally during the last Republican administration, they put in some some people, Charles James, Jr. I think he was, senior, and uh, they were very conservative, and uh, they always had a policy there of being to put two people on the chopping block at the same time, a black and a non-black, mm -hmm. and they put us both on the block. And uh, they didn't have enough nerve to uh, get rid of the black woman, but they got rid of the white man. Okay. And uh, I took them to court with a great attorney. Spent about forty-seven thousand dollars towards his career, and uh, did not prevail. But I'm glad I made that fight too. Well, in the d judge's decision, essentially, he says that an agency that is established to fight for civil rights is hard to believe that could, they could be violating somebody's civil rights. Even though it was a red card. Even hard though. to believe it happening. Do you know thing? Well, you see, <laughs> the problem was that it was a very strong Republican administration then. It was a, a person that was put in charge was a very strong and I went in front of the judge who was uh, the chief judge. And if you make an appeal of his, his decision, he goes to two people who work for him, or three people who work for him. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a difficult situation. Yeah. But it has not made a, a long line for public of course. I could assume <laughs> not. <laughs> uh, I keep telling Carol that they're evil. But <laughs> she says, well, maybe not, but I don't know. Well, they're evil on both sides. But um, if you were to ask me mm. in private sector, let's go back to the investment banking firm in the 70s. I did sue, uh, file a complaint with Eleanor Holmes, uh, Norton's uh, Committee, Commission on Civil Rights in New York City. Uh, I did hire an attorney who was radical. Uh, I can't remember her name now. Whatever it was, I was appalled when it came to the proposal and it said uh, $1 settlement. She said, oh, that's just a lawyer's trick. <laughs> yeah, um, but she had represented that's some perfect. prostitutes in New York City. And I figured I had to get uh, the meanest son of a bitch in the valley, <laughs> sort of, because I was going against the establishment on Wall Street. And surely they would pull out a lot of money, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm sure Solomon Brothers didn't want to have any taint on their name. So I hired her, and she was, I can't remember her name. If I find it, I'll email you. Mm -hmm. um, and um, she negotiated. I left Salomon, uh, finished my degree, uh, looked for another job, got a job with another international bank, American Express, was sent immediately to Germany, because I spoke German, uh, first woman to go abroad in that capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a message from her that we, she settled the case with Salomon for $10,000 which was big money in those days for yeah. such a case. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember what the house cost that I lived in then. Um, so, I mean, I was paying rent in Manhattan $140 a month on the Upper West Side, off Central Park West, different dollar. It was a really different dollar. <laughs> but in those days, I mean, we, we contemplated yeah. making this a class action. Because remember, I was sitting in a room with about six other women. Mm -hmm. equally situated. All of them married with children. I was the only one who was not at the time. And uh, 
once my case was filed, I couldn't get anybody to join me, let alone I became a pariah. They just, they were told, I was told, my husband doesn't want me to associate with you. Yeah. So that was another reason why I figured I got to get out of there. Um, because it was just not a healthy environment. And um, we, we progressed. I remember going from uh, in another situation, and this time there was lots of press. Um, I don't know where, but if I have find the article, I'll make a photocopy and send it to you. But they talked about another case that I uh, was behind, because after we settled Solomon and I got another degree, I went to work for Chase, Manhattan Bank. And I guess when Chase did some background work, they found that I had sued Salomon Brothers and mm -hmm. settled. They said, well, we can't, we can't hire you um, because of what you did with Salomon Brothers. And I had become familiar with the law mm -hmm. uh, based on now the, the employment committee of now. I said, well, you know, if you do that, it's called retaliation, cited to the section of the Civil Rights Act of 64. I said, and in the eyes of the court at the time, this is much more serious than the initial act of discrimination by a former employer. So they turned around and gave me the job. Mm. Uh, and that kind of behavior tracks with you as you go through your career. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it happened to me in the in the commerce department. Uh, although it wasn't, I don't think the first uh, challenge was based on sex, but it might have a number of combinations. But as you know, in federal government, your first year with them, you're a probationary employee, and you can be fired for any reason, any reason, or almost no reason, or almost no reason. And I was outspoken because of the way I'm now a lawyer. Um, they were taking certain actions against uh, exporters, which I believed were not legal. And I raised the issue, I said, for example, your friendly subpoena does not carry if you're really intending to make this a criminal violation. Mm -hmm. It has to be administrative, uh, criminal. Um, so at the 50th week of my tenure as a probationary employee, I got a essential pink slip, a letter saying you are terminated as of X date for, quote, your attitude towards the law, unquote. The wrong thing to tell Being the lawyer. That it should be maybe followed? Well, <laughs> <laughs> one would think. <laughs> you're, you're just not, uh, just not following You're your not playing with the rules, Carol. Um, and I, well, you were playing by the rules. You weren't playing by the customs. It, yeah, but, and, yeah. And their rules. And I remember there were a whole set of banks, you know, queued up. And remember, I had long uh, experience uh, before the law in banking. And they were dealing with some financial instruments that they did not have a lot of knowledge about. And I, I said, oh, you know, really? you are you are really interpreting this very incorrectly. Uh, this was the anti boycott office. And I said, well, there are three contracts in a letter of credit. I won't belabor you with the, the legality, but you're pinging violations on something that the exporter has no involvement in. It can't negotiate with the import importer's bank. He said, well, if we, we believe your argument, we will have to let 62 cases go. And we spent so much time trying to develop violations on them. And so the director at the time said, well, this would be a good opportunity. Let's set everybody out to do research on whether or not it is legal what we're doing. So, of course, I wrote a long paper, and I said, you know, you're against these, uh, uh, the documentary, the law governing letters of credit. For these reasons, I went, even got in touch with the people back in England who were part of the committee that, that drafted these. So I got what was behind the wording. And at the end of the day, we had this wonderful seminar, sort of. Everybody got up and made their case, pro or con. And uh, at the end, the director said, well, you raised some interesting points, Carol, but unfortunately, we're going to have to go with the other side because we will have to close 62 cases without a violation. I was appalled. 